In today's episode, we talk all things pregnancy, calorie needs by trimester, how to overcome food aversions, the importance of different nutrients in the body, foods that you can consume when you're maybe experiencing adversions, as well as covering some of our top prenatal and pregnancy supplement recommendations. You hear all the bull about diet and exercise. Carbs are evil. Do more cardio. Never eat bread or cookies again. Just do a juice cleanse. We get it. We fell for all the BS too. It's time to go right to the source with the truth about how to live a healthy, sustainable lifestyle. I am Liz. And I'm Becca. We are your nutrition educators and this is The Food Code. Hello, happy Wednesday, happy February. Oh my goodness. Seeing all of my half birthday. Oh, well, happy half birthday. Maybe you can actually. I remember when I used to do that. (laughs) Maybe you can actually use your gift card for your massage. You just reminded me, I need to call today to set up. I'm going to get my nails done because I don't know when else I'm going to go or be able to go before we leave next week. And Mm -hmm. we have a wedding next weekend. So like a dip will totally last me two weeks. So I'm going to go tomorrow and get it done. So, but yes, I actually looked up massages on Saturday. I'm considering going for one on Saturday. Becca has been considering going for massage for the past six months. (laughs) You know what? I, I, you know what I will say? And I actually was reading about this and only because of how I train. Sometimes I fear That like massages Mm -hmm. or chiropractic work actually open up your body to more injury potential yeah. because they like gain, you get you like more range of motion or you like, you know, it just uncovers more imbalances. And so sometimes I actually fear doing stuff like that. I know it sounds crazy, but. I think you just need the right massage therapist. And Mm -hmm. I love having the sports massage therapist at my chiropractor Mm -hmm. because they get it right. They get that. They were amazing. You're lifting and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, when I went during pregnancy, speaking of pregnancy, aren't you happy goodness. you're past that phase? <laughs> yes, I am very happy that I'm past that phase. I'll be honest. I don't hate being pregnant. Like I actually don't mind being pregnant. My third pregnancy with the most recent, like with Taylor, the end of it was rough. I was very uncomfortable. Carson, I like didn't notice that as much. This one, I had um, SPD pain, which is like kind of like your pelvic pain bones get a little shifted um which is what I was going to the chiropractor for but I was it was summertime Carson just wanted to be outside he wanted to go to the park he want I like I couldn't be on my feet for more than 20 or 30 minutes um so it was the end of it was rough um with with that one I was pretty uncomfortable but for the most part I really didn't mind being pregnant my first trimesters always suck I always get horrible morning sickness horrible constipation um but by you know 12 14 weeks until like 37 weeks they're actually not bad i don't mind being pregnant that much yeah so um don't love postpartum you know i don't think any woman does um i love newborns and i think they're adorable and so so fun taylor's in such a fun age right now my mother-in-law just sent me a video of her she like she's in the bouncer for the first time and it's just so cute like she's such a ham she and is a ham just, her cheeks are so big she's they're so, so fat so she's cute so fat she's like the, I don't know. She's like, I, I was buying clothes today at Target unnecessarily for her. Um, and I was like, do I get 12 months? Do I get nine, like six to nine? Because she's almost six months, but she doesn't fit in six months clothes. She's in neither nine month or 12 month clothes because she's so long. Um, but yeah, baby clothes. I mean, like, you know, you just love on them whenever like I pick her up from daycare. And I feel so bad because you know, I love Carson just as much, but like yeah. the newborn stage is you just want to hold them and give them all the kisses and cuddle them. Well, she can't talk back to you or draw on couches or <laughs> do all the toddler things that <laughs> we love every day. Uh, I was telling Becca this morning. So Art and I have been going to the gym after we drop him off. If I don't have a meeting that starts until nine and we're like, okay, we're gonna leave the house by seven fifteen. It's 737 again, because he's in this stage of procrastinating, running away when I'm trying to get his socks on, telling me that, you know, he needs milk or he needs more food. He needs this car. He's running downstairs to the basement. And I'm like, dude, we got to go like get in the car. Let's go. That's Carson at bedtime. It sucks. Mm -hmm. My child's like a teenager. He wants, he doesn't want to go to sleep. He literally like we put him down at 830, which is late, but he will sometimes lay in bed 
literally staring at the ceiling until 10 p.m. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, I can't let him stay up that late. Like at least try to get him into bed by 8.30. But then in the morning, he doesn't want to get out of bed. Yeah. I went to, Nick and I went to go get him yesterday because it was the first day back at daycare. Get out of my room. Turn off the light. I'm like, you're three years old. Like, (laughs) get out of bed. Oh my goodness. I can't wait for the middle age high school. Uh, Actually, I can. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it was like last night, Marcus was, I I don't know if they fed him sugar for his afternoon snack or what happened, but it's like 7.30, we get out of the bathtub. He's been going down between 7.30 and 8. And he is running around the house, just screaming, like jumping off the, like bouncing off the walls, like jumping off the couch, wants to watch the animal. He's doing all the animal noises. (laughs) It's so fun. And you want to stay and hang out with him, but you're also like, I need to go to bed because it's Mm -hmm. time for me to have my hour of sanity. So anyways, today we wanted to do this podcast. We have a couple of clients that are pregnant. We have a couple that are uh, postpartum. And we know that a lot of our listeners are family planning or, you know, considering starting a family soon. And so we wanted to talk through pregnancy needs, um, you know, calorie needs, nutrient needs, really, really important things around fatty acids and protein, even though we may not want it all the time and we might deal with some adversions, which we will dive into and talk through that. We want to help you understand why they are so important, um, not for just the mom, but also for baby and the development of your baby. Uh, And then we are going to share just some other things regarding like prenatals and things that we have taken, things that we recommend. uh, And then we will just, you know, go through a bunch of other foods with vitamins and minerals and the benefits of those things. So hopefully this helps you. Uh, It's probably going to be a little bit of a longer episode today, but we are here for it. Take some notes or re-listen if you need to share it with somebody. If you know someone who is trying to get pregnant or has just recently gotten pregnant, um, share this with them because we know, especially as a first time mom, it's like, you're so excited. And then you get that test that shows, okay, I'm pregnant. And it's like, it just hits you and it's so real. And now everything becomes about how do I support a healthy pregnancy? So, yeah. And I think the hard thing with pregnancy is you get kind of into that pregnancy mode of I'm pregnant YOLO. Like I'm going to get the donut that I don't normally get. I'm going to get the Taco Bell Mm -hmm. because I'm craving it at 9 p.m. at night. Like, and we kind of just get into this mindset of might as well, because I'm going to get fat anyways, you know, because I'm pregnant. And I think that we sometimes forget or maybe fail to recognize how important the pregnancy is for baby Mm -hmm. and how important what we take in is for baby's development and not just like for them to have a healthy birth and, you know, be at a healthy place when they get born, but setting them up for life. Like Mm -hmm. what you guys do during your pregnancy sets up your baby for life in terms of their gut makeup, in terms of, you know, how their body's going to tolerate things their immune system, like brain development. That is why you need to take prenatals when you're pregnant. That is why, you know, the doctors push that so much because there's a purpose to them. And so we want to kind of talk about those purposes today um, and hopefully give some insight into, although yes, pregnancy can be a time where you give yourself some more grace. And like, believe me, during my first trimester, I could not look at a vegetable. There was no chance. Like I was so sick. I, I would like get Chipotle as the only way to get vegetables in. Like it just wasn't happening. But once you can, hopefully at some point in your pregnancy, tolerate those foods again, understanding the importance of them. Um, So we want to start with just like caloric needs by trimester. And I do, I loosely track during pregnancy um, because I think it is very helpful to understand like one, making sure that you're not under eating. um, And then two, as you go through each trimester, there are some increasing needs um, for you and for baby. And so what they, how they determine these is basically they break down total gestational needs during the entire pregnancy and then divide it by the trimesters. So basically the first trimester, they say about 100 to 200 extra calories. You don't really need a whole lot more compared to baseline in your first trimester. Second trimester, an extra 300. And by the end, you're eating in total an extra like 400 to 500 calories compared to baseline. So um, a lot of people, you know, struggle with this. I struggled with really bad indigestion during my third pregnancy, um, things that I didn't struggle with with the first two pregnancies. Um, I was just like, by the end of the day, I didn't even want to eat because I was so full feeling. Like it felt like food was sitting in my throat. Um, but 
as much as I could, I would try and get in enough intake. And also, I think the biggest thing is like understanding how this sets you up for postpartum. Um, if you are under eating during a pregnancy, or if you are, you know, not eating adequately, think about postpartum when you get there, where your body's at, um, and understanding what the needs are for postpartum. Because for me, what I was thinking of is during even my pregnancy, I was like, I want to set myself up for at the point when I am ready and comfortable to go into potentially like a fat loss phase. I haven't been under eating up until then, because I think a lot of times when we don't pay attention to that, we naturally just don't eat enough for our bodies. So that's what I was thinking about during pregnancy too, is like, I want when I do try to diet and I'm done breastfeeding and I'm done doing those things, I want it to work. <laughs> and so I'm going to eat enough, especially because that's good for me. That's good for baby. It's good for recovery. And then it makes my life a lot easier on the back end. Yep. Really, really important. And I think we only think about the pregnancy when we're in the pregnancy. But the other big thing too is thinking about your stress, the stress that's being placed on your body. I mean, ladies, you are creating a human. It's the most beautiful thing I think <laughs> um, of human life is like you are creating another human and your stress on your body, like maybe you don't feel super stressed, like there is still a huge stress to your body. And so making sure that you are providing it the nutrients that you need to handle and adapt to the stress in the best way possible is really, really important. So let's talk a little bit about prenatals. I know that many of you, uh, if you've listened to our podcast in the past, we have a couple of ep other episodes on pregnancy, how to prepare for pregnancy. So you can always go back and listen to those things. But I'm going to just share a little bit about as Art and I are family planning, I've already started taking prenatals again. And so the brands that I like and the things that I'm using right now, um, my prenatal is Pure Encapsulations. And then I'm also doing Nordic Naturals, a prenatal DHA. And so one quick note regarding any type of prenatal out there, you want to make sure that it's a high quality supplement. We're not just buying it, you know, from the Walgreens or, you know, a low quality supplement. You always want to make sure anything that you're putting in your body is high quality. Uh, and then when it comes to, you know, the prenatal specifically, you want to make sure that you're choosing one that has folate, not folic acid, as folic acid is the synthetic version of folate. So that's not naturally occurring. Um, and you can find folate, um, you know, in a lot of fortified foods as well, rice, pasta, bread, breakfast cereals, things like that. Um, but your body just doesn't utilize the synthetic version of it the same way. So want to make sure that you're reading the label on that for your prenatal and then checking that it does have folate. And then the reason why I am taking DHA in addition is because DHA provides so many different benefits to a healthy full-term pregnancy and it promotes, you know, brain development, eye development in your baby. You know, for me, looking back at my pregnancy with Marcus, if you haven't heard my story, we ended up um, being induced at 37 weeks because I had IUGR, intrauterine growth restriction. And so he was very small. I was giving him all the nutrients. We were doing all the right things. I didn't struggle with preeclampsia or anything like that. But I probably could have done a bit better job had I known, you know, some of the risk factors because in my first pregnancy, I did not take um, DHA and DHA will support full-term pregnancy. Um, it is utilized rapidly by the baby's brain and retina during pregnancy. So omega-3 fatty acids, including the EPA and DHA are building blocks of the baby's brains and retina. So very, very important. And the accumulation actually occurs um, until age two. So DHA intake is essential while you are breastfeeding and you know even if you're formula feeding too making sure that the formula that you have contains DHA and so for me i eat a lot of high quality healthy fats i did you know have some salmon and some um, other fatty fish in my pregnancy but one mistake you know i look back on and you know wish that i would have done differently is take a DHA in addition to the prenatal so i'm doing that uh, this time and Becca, you can share, you know, a little bit about your prenatal supplements that you did. I know you also took the Nordic Naturals yep. DHA. Yep. I did the Nordic Naturals DHA EPA. Um, and then I did Garden of Life, my kind organic prenatal. Um, I can't remember where it was referred to me by. I think one of my friends is a NICU nurse um, that has started a like breastfeeding consultant company since then. Um, and so I believe that I saw it on her stuff. Um, and I looked into it and, you know, it seems like a high quality one um because you definitely want to look through the ingredients and the amounts and making sure that it has all the things that you need um but yeah that's the one that i took during pregnancy but yeah 
the EPA D- DHA is a big thing because also you can't you're not supposed to eat a whole lot of like seafood during pregnancy because of different mercury levels. Um, some seafoods are more safe than others. Um, tuna in particular is extremely high in mercury, but I didn't do a whole lot of seafood during pregnancy. I don't do a whole lot of seafood in general, just cause I'm really, I don't enjoy cooking it. Um, but when you're not getting those and like the healthy fats from those things like salmon, sardines, such, you just aren't getting it. And so because it is so important during pregnancy, that is why I do that. I also took choline. Um, so you can get choline from eggs. Eggs is like the highest naturally occurring source of choline, but I took a separate choline because there is a lot of newer research that shows the importance of choline for baby's brain development. Um, so I also did, it was nested brand, I think it is, N-E-S-T-E-D. Um, I took the separate choline as well. So I basically took three separate um, pregnancy support supplements during my pregnancy. Uh, and then food wise, I made sure that once I was able to start eating, you know, the things, all the things again, um, I tried to get in again as much as I could. And even during the times that I was kind of like more morning sickness, um, I was like, what can I do? That's like, at least, okay. What can I add in? Even though my base of my meals isn't like, you know, I'm having big old salads and stir fries and all the vegetables and stuff like that. Can I do, you know, like a sandwich at lunch with some baby carrots on the side or like half an apple? Or can I do, you know, I was tolerating yogurt during the time. Okay. So I would do like a full fat Greek yogurt with a little bit of fruit on it and some peanut butter. That was like my dinner, um, you know, with like a peanut butter and jelly or something like that. So I was trying not to go totally to the other side of give me all the fast food and crap and you know fried foods that yeah part of me really wanted um and find somewhere in the middle that was like okay how can i still get some nourishment to my body um i was doing a lot of like the lightly breaded purdue chicken tenders that at carson we feed carson um i was doing that to get protein in because we're going to talk about protein here in just a second um but it's it's looking at okay if i don't feel amazing if i don't want my normal foods what can I do that's like still getting my body adequate nourishment? Because protein is so important in pregnancy, like the most important macronutrient that I would say that in fat, that and healthy fats are kind of like a little bit of a tie. And so in Western countries, I think that a lot of people, the hardest thing is like the reason that you don't want protein in your pregnancy, especially early on, the body knows that protein can be a dangerous food um, mm-hmm. because of the ability to undercook protein and have bacteria and have harmful things that can then in turn harm baby. Um, but at the end of the day, protein is extremely necessary for the pregnancy. Yep. Yep. So I was doing a little bit of research for this and it's very interesting because it's been assumed that in Western countries, protein intake is adequate or maybe even a little bit elevated for some individuals. But there was a research study done, first ever study on pregnant women to look at the protein needs. And what they found is that the protein recommendations in pregnancy were in fact too low. And low protein intake during pregnancy increases risk for several factors. And one of the top ones, and we'll dive into blood sugar in a few minutes here, is disease later on in life when we are malnourished. And so optimal protein intake, this is going to be, this is going to vary by person, right? It varies by person in general, but research shows that that you know, we want to have at least like 80 to 100 grams of protein, depending upon you know the size of the person and obviously what you can tolerate as well. Um, but research also shares some things that it can support and some side effects that it can actually reduce. And so one of those is swelling and fluid retention. If you've ever been pregnant, hello, swollen feet and swollen ankles give me all the protein or anything that's going to help (laughs) reduce that. Um, But research also shows us that it is essential for brain and tissue development for baby. You guys, every single cell in our body is made up of protein. And so it would make sense that if you are pregnant and you are growing a human, you're creating a human literally inside of you, you need more protein. And so we need to focus on you know, protein intake. And we'll talk about some ways if you're having food aversions, meat aversions, we totally get that. You can also get good protein from collagen as well. But protein is critical for ensuring, again, the proper growth of tissues and organs, including the brain. And so what we're going to dive into is understanding why 
right? Why is protein so important? Well, protein is broken down into building blocks called amino acids that you need to build and create new cells. And so as you can imagine, There's a lot of new cells being created during pregnancy, um, and therefore, we want to make sure that we are doing our best to support mom and, you know, the uterus of the growing baby by eating adequate protein. So let's touch on a little bit, you know, of the aversions. I know for me, I had aversions to chicken when I was pregnant, the smell of certain things. I didn't want to cook things. And so I did, I relied on a lot of shakes at certain times, like making smoothies. They were just a little bit easier to get down on days that I was kind of feeling nauseous. And inside of that, I would put not only a high quality protein powder, but I would usually put like a good quality Greek yogurt in there just to get a really good amount, probably 40 grams, uh, 40 to 45 grams I was putting in my smoothies. And then I would add things like chia seed or flax seed to help get some good omega threes, sometimes avocado. So there's a lot of ways that you can get good protein in, even if we're not, you know, eating meat. And so this would also speak to more of like the plant-based population as well. That would be a, a, the number one thing I would say is like, start your day with a good dose of protein and do it in a way, you know, that you can tolerate if you're dealing with that nausea or adversions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was also like wrap protein and carbs <laughs> as much as I could. So it was a lot of like wraps and turkey burgers and tacos and things that I could hide protein in per se, um, or kind of mask the proteinness of it. Um, so I was doing a lot of that. I was even making like, I remember during Carson's pregnancy, I needed flavor. Like I couldn't mm-hmm. eat my normal chicken and vegetables and sweet potatoes. Like I was making like shrimp tostadas and like all these different things. Cause I just need po boys. I needed the flavor to it. So try and think about, okay, if I don't want eggs in the morning, can I do breakfast tacos with like eggs and bacon inside? If I don't, or like a breakfast sandwich I did a lot of times with Carson. Um, if I don't want, you know, a normal chicken breast at night, can I do, can I chop it up and put it in like a high protein wrap or a high fiber wrap or something like that? So try and think about how you can hide it per se um, in different things to help get the protein in because protein rich foods are also extremely high in a lot of nutrients that you cannot get from other things. So things like vitamin B12, choline, I already talked about zinc, iron is extremely important during pregnancy. Um, And so meeting your protein needs means that you are more likely to meet your vitamin and mineral needs from the foods that you're getting as well. Like Liz was talking about, it reduces swelling and retention, water retention with all of my pregnancies, just until the very end with my pregnancy with Taylor, I was a little swollen, but even with that, like I, I never really had swelling in all any of my pregnancies. Um, I, you know, didn't have massive water dumps at the, like I was pretty good with all of that. And I, attribute a lot of that to my diet. Um, it is also the basically the reason that you end up with less swelling is because low protein in your blood can cause low blood osmolality. Oh my gosh. Osmolality. Osmolality. That is a hard word to say. <laughs> it is a hard word to say. <laughs> it's basically the, your blood thickness. So the blood thickness level. And the lower blood thickness level results in fluids leaking out of the blood vessels into surrounding tissues, which is known as edema. People know what edema is. It's basically fluid retention. Um, And in one study in 2020, low plasma protein was associated with edema in the second and third trimesters. So adequate protein equals less swelling. No one likes to be swollen. Um, And then it also promotes healthy weight gain. And this is a big thing. It's like, you guys, during pregnancy, because of the high progesterone levels to support the pregnancy, you have more insulin resistance, meaning you do not tolerate carbs as well during pregnancy. And so having the higher protein intake, protein's very satiating, it allows you to manage cravings, to manage overeating. And it supports a healthier glycemic response because protein is extremely helpful with balancing blood sugar levels versus like if you have a bowl of cereal, pure sugar, your body's getting that pure sugar. But if you pair that bowl of cereal with some eggs, big difference in how your body responds to it. So protein is extremely important when it comes to all of these benefits. 
And that is why we push it so much and try to encourage it. During my pregnancy, I, you know, there were a lot of times where I wasn't really wanting it, but I made sure I was at least getting 140 to 150 grams a day. Um, and I would utilize sometimes a protein bar. I would utilize protein smoothie in the morning. You know, lunch was the chicken tenders <laughs> because it's chicken tenders in the air fryer with like, you know, whatever I can pick on the side. Um, and then dinner time, I was either having the Greek yogurt if I could tolerate it or some type of dinner. Um, by that point, I really didn't want to eat much food, but trying to fit things in where you can. Yeah. Yeah. And just want to touch on preeclampsia too. Uh, this is something that I experienced right at the end um, when I was being induced. And basically this relates to your blood pressure. My blood pressure skyrocketed, uh, my blood platelets dropped. And so it resulted in an emergency C-section, but protein can decrease your risk for preeclampsia. And so throughout the pregnancy, as we've been talking about, right, your body is building more blood, more vessels, more tissue to support the mother and the baby. And so protein rich foods with all of those good amino acids, that's supplying you the building block to meet those increased demands and decrease some of the risk factors for developing preeclampsia, like hypertension, high blood pressure, um, you know, blood sugar regulation too. We're going to talk about that in a second. So this is where I would say if you are at risk and you know you're at risk um, for preeclampsia, you need to be working with, you know, your doctor and potentially, you know, somebody who can help you with your nutrition throughout pregnancy. Again, we understand there's adversions. We understand we're, we're not craving the things that we normally crave in our day-to-day -day life, but we've got to get the protein in. And in particular, when it comes to healthy blood pressure and preeclampsia, one one of the aminos in protein called glycine is especially helpful for blood pressure. And so glycine produces elastin, a structural protein that helps your blood vessels expand and contract. And so if you're not able to tolerate, you know, a lot of meat, then you can look to do other things, um, which are really great sources of glycine uh, in terms of like connective tissues. So you could do things like bone broth, a pot roast or a stew, um, collagen or a gelatin powder. I know there was a period in my pregnancy that I was doing like a lot of uh, jello and, um, you know, puddings and things like that with a little bit of gelatin powder in it because I could just stomach it that better than I could actually sitting down and eating, you know, a chicken breast. But the biggest thing, and this is one thing that I don't think gets talked about enough, is protein will help you so stabilize your blood sugar levels. And this is really, really important because we talk about blood sugar a lot, right? In terms of, you know, we want to maintain healthy blood sugar levels and stay stable throughout the day. So we have good energy throughout the day. We're not, you know, taking that um, low, feeling like crap and craving all the carbs and the sugar. But if you are riding the blood sugar roller coaster and you're pregnant, this can actually lead to birth defects. Um, and it can put you at a higher risk for diabetes uh, in in pregnancy. And so we have to remember that, as Becca said in the beginning, everything that we consume gets passed on to the baby. And so blood sugar is the food source essentially for the fetus. And it passes from the mother through the placenta to the baby. And if you are experiencing, you know, diabetes, maybe you're coming in and you already have diabetes or you are on the brink of type two diabetes, you really need to pay attention to this. Or maybe in your family, you have a history of gestational diabetes. You need to pay attention to this because it's not even just the diabetes, but it's also poorly controlled blood sugar that can put the baby at risk for becoming insulin resistant and setting them up to not you know, have good blood sugar levels um, because everything that you're eating, the excess amount of sugar from the donuts and the ice cream and the cake and the cookies, all of that gets transported to the baby. Yeah. I've actually seen this in a couple of people that I know that had a large fear around pregnancy and were under eating during pregnancy that ended up with gestational diabetes as well, because it's not just high blood sugar. Mm -hmm. It is the swings of blood sugar. It is when you let blood sugar get way too low and then your body has to create it to help produce mm -hmm. the right levels to keep you in that optimal range. So it's not just about eating a bunch of crap. It's eating inconsistently. It's eating the wrong types of foods. And so understand like, it's not just, oh, well, I'm not just eating a bunch of sugar. It's not necessarily the case. Like if you go into a pregnancy with already having some levels of insulin resistance, you become more likely because like I just talked about when you are pregnant, this is why when you're pregnant, it's such a high risk. You become more insulin resistant naturally. And that is because it is for baby's purpose. You become more insulin resistant so that your body does not burn through energy as quickly so that it can give energy to baby. It is all for a purpose. I mean, it sucks. Yeah, no one wants to be, <laughs> no one wants to be like, put on fat, like, let's put on some more fat for me. Like, sure, great, let's do it. 
but it's all for a purpose. Our bodies are designed so perfectly to be able to do this. But when we don't watch it, it can go a wire. And so basically, excess amounts of sugar get transported to baby, like Liz was just talking about. Since the baby does not have diabetes, the baby is then able to increase the production of insulin substantially in order to use the extra sugar. This abnormal cycle of events can basically result in complications, though. So there's something called fetal marcosomia, which is resulting from fetal, fetal hyperinsulinemia in response to maternal diabetes. And this might be a predictor for later glucose intolerance. So basically, if mom ends up with gestational diabetes, it can then basically predict long-term glucose intolerance for baby. And this is what we're talking about. Like, it's not just health of pregnancy, health of baby as soon as they're born. It's what is going on with that baby the rest of their life. Like, how are we setting our babies up for the best possible situation? And then maternal diabetes during pregnancy can lead to a tra transgenerational transmission of diabetes risk. So it increases. This is where type 2 diabetes can be somewhat genetic because you can create this risk within the pregnancy. And in response to the excess amounts of sugar that the baby receives, large amounts of insulin are produced by the baby in order to convert the sugar into body fat. That is, the baby is basically being overfed while inside the uterus. And it can harm eyes, kidneys, heart, basically things that diabetes can harm in humans. Mm -hmm. Babies are humans before they're born and they get the same type of responses within the body. So in early pregnancy, high blood sugar and then lead to defects in growing baby. And so you guys, we're not fear mongering here. Like I'm not like never eat sugar when you're pregnant. I eat a donut almost every day with freaking my second pregnant. Like there is, <laughs> there is a balance that needs to be created. And if you know that you are higher risk, you just need to be a little careful. You need there, like, we just have to take some self responsibility here because we are growing a human. It is an amazing miracle of life, but our actions do not come without consequence. And so we need to know what I am doing basically sets this baby up. Yep. And so as much as we can tolerate it, as much as our appetites can tolerate it, we need to be aware of how to set that baby up for the best possible situation. Yeah. And I think one thing that I, I, you know, I think would be easy in pregnancy, I just found these, I know Becca has been talking about fair life for a while, but mm -hmm. at Costco, they have fair life protein shakes. They literally taste to me like a chocolate milkshake almost. And they're 30 grams of protein, 150 calories. Ingredients are pretty good. And so if I was pregnant and I was craving bagels, carbohydrates, right? First thing in the morning and felt like I couldn't eat eggs or I was having a protein aversion, I would at least drink that with the donut to offset, you know, the just sugar spike and, you know, all of the carbohydrates. So again, it's not that you can never have those things in pregnancy. It's thinking about how we're pairing them with other foods to support blood sugar staying stable. And I know towards the end for me, when the nutrition needs were really high, I honestly was so full, kind of like Becca was saying, like you just get to the end of the day and you're so full because the baby's pushing on all your organs that I went a little bit higher fat, higher protein in that time just to get calories in. So things like nut butters, right? Um, I tried to do like a lot of rice cakes and just kind of cleaner carbohydrates. So we'll kind of talk through that more at the end. But if you're only able to tolerate, let's say you're in your first trimester right now and you feel like I'm only able to tolerate carbohydrates, that's all that sounds good or appetizing, then let's just look at more nourishing carbohydrates that we could consume. You know, I know Becca does the rice crackers, they're three ingredients, things like that versus doing bags of chips, things um, that are, you know, just really, really dense in carbs and unhealthy ingredients. So let's talk a little bit about um, nutrient needs by trimester outside of the fatty acids and outside of of the protein that we've just talked through because there are some specific needs as you go through each trimester based upon how, you know, baby is growing and the development that happens in each trimester. Yep, for sure. So during your first trimester, we talked about folate. Um, so folate is a B vitamin. And during your first trimester, which is up to 12 to 14 weeks, it's extremely important to take that folate supplement, which is why prenatals are so important. That even like, like Liz was saying, in, during family planning, because a lot of people don't know they're pregnant <laughs> until like six to eight weeks in. Um, and so it's important to make sure that you're taking those if you're planning to get pregnant um, and include the foods that we can as much as possible. So 
B vitamins are found in a lot of red meats. They're found in a lot of leafy greens. Um, and so utilizing those as much as possible to help protect that unborn baby from developing defects in the nervous system. So neural tube defects are a big result of nutrient deficiencies, um, such as like spina bifida is a big one that they check for usually in early pregnancy. And spina bifida happens essentially when the protective covering doesn't grow properly around the baby's spinal cord. Um, and it can lead to permanent damage. And it's extremely important to take a good vitamin supplement during the first trimester if you are planning to get pregnant um and this is you know like you guys it's all devastating like i that's why we lost our second pregnancy and it it was nothing to do with me ours was a genetic disorder um but we impact this baby's well-being and i know that's a heavy weight to carry that is why <laughs> pregnancy can right. be very hard and emotional and same thing with postpartum but the beautiful thing is we have control over a lot of things and so if there is any peace of mind during pregnancy, like have it be the peace of mind that you are doing as well as you can with what you're giving your body to help this baby grow in the best way possible. And God will handle the rest. Um, but you know, if there's anything that we can prevent for, you know, bettering the health of our baby, I, I would want to, you know, I, personally, I would want to be doing that. And that's why we want to give this information because I think a lot of times it's like, you go to the doctor, here's a prenatal, make sure you're taking it. And that's it. Like there is so much more that we can be doing for our bodies to help support pregnancy, to help, help support the baby and to help support you for recovery postpartum. Because one of the biggest drivers of postpartum depression and nasty postpartum situations is nutrient deficiencies mm -hmm. and lack of nourishment. So keeping that in mind. Yep. Another really big thing for fatty acids. I mean, your brain is 80% fat. And so if we're consuming food or fats that are inflammatory, right? That are not good for us. We're not going to feel our best. And so I always think of that too, just in general, right? Just in general life. But as you move into the second trimester, we talked about this briefly in the beginning, your calorie intake should increase a little bit more. So I think this is very person independent, but you know, on average, the research tells us that you want to be eating about 300 calories more in the second trimester. And again, we want these to be well-balanced meals, nutrient dense meals, as much as you can tolerate to support the baby good blood sugar levels and yourself. Um, in the second trimester, this is where a lot of people start having problems digestively, right? They might become a little bit more intolerant to certain foods, more sensitive to certain foods because the, the baby is now really growing and starting to push on things in the body. It's super comfortable. I wish that my husband could go through pregnancy himself to feel it, but, um, this can cause indigestion and acid reflux. And so not only from a blood sugar standpoint, but just also for staying comfortable, right? Um, digestively, what we would recommend is try eating smaller meals, you know, throughout the day, mm -hmm. taking short walks that can help a ton that can also help with, you know, other hip pain as well. That was one thing that helped me a lot is just staying mobile, doing stretching, things like that. Um, and then here we want to make sure that we're focusing on good sources of calcium. So if you do become, you know, intolerant to dairy, what we would recommend is a lot of leafy greens, salmon, foods that are higher in calcium. Calcium is a cofactor. So there's so many different uh, functions in the body. And there's a lot of foods that contain calcium that are not dairy. So give a simple Google search for that. You guys can find you know a list out there, but there's a lot of different sources of calcium. So this is where I kind of think about, you know, when you can incorporate some of those green leafy vegetables again, or you can throw, you know, smoothie, uh, sorry, spinach into your smoothie or something like that go ahead and start incorporating more of those things um, into your day. Seeds are also nutritional powerhouses um, and many of them are high in calcium. So here you could do like sesame seed, celery seed, chia seed, poppy seed. I remember making lemon poppy seed muffins when I was pregnant with protein in them. Those were so good and it got all of my nutrients in as well as some additional uh, minerals too. So beans and lentils. I did a lot of almonds and nuts when I was pregnant just because I felt like I could snack on those more easily easily than, you know, leafy greens, but to each their own, you just want to make sure that you are, you're focusing on a good dose of calcium. Yeah, absolutely. And then come to the third trimester. Yeah, obviously we'll start to feel full, you know, much more quickly as baby starts to basically triple in size. And you may find that eating smaller amounts of food continually during the day, I basically turned into just like constant snacker during my third trimester um, and trying to get in just like small snacks, small meals, um, break apart my meals as much as I could uh, to help continue to get the balanced intake throughout the end of the day. Paying close attention, obviously, to your diet during pregnancy, you guys, will help you feel better. And it may even help settle morning sickness. I'll be honest, 
I a lot of times would feel my best first thing in the morning when I would go and work out and then my breakfast. Um, and I don't know why, I don't know if it was the movement that tended to settle my stomach a little bit, but like that was when I was able to get in the best meal. And then the rest of the day was like, just trying to hold on until, you know, obviously at the end of my pregnancy, I felt a lot better with that. Um, but you know, a qualified nutritionist can help, you know, you can work with a nutritionist to find a balanced diet for yourself an exercise program. Liz and I both obviously, and our coaches have experience with that as well. Um, I did a lot of my own research around pregnancy because unfortunately, and this is no fault to doctors or OBGYNs. OBGYNs guys are basically surgeons. They are there to make sure that you and baby are safe during birth. They are not exercise experts around pregnancy. Well, at least most of them are not. They are not diet experts around pregnancy. And so a lot of times they will give the most cautious recommendations, which is fair. Like they don't want to step over any lines, especially when it's not something that you know, is technically their expertise area. And so they're going to tell you, do not lift heavy. They're going to tell you, you know, make sure that, you know, you're not eating X, Y, and Z. You don't eat too much. So you don't gain too much because they're most fearful of gestational diabetes. Like that is not their area of expertise. And so that is why sometimes you have to do your own research or find someone that is more knowledgeable in that area and listen to your body. Like, you know, what feels right, what doesn't feel right. In terms of exercise, I went off of it went, what what fitness state was I going into the pregnancies with that, and then I would simply try to maintain a fitness level. I would do similar workouts that I was already doing, and I would simply scale back as I went along. Especially as my belly got in the way of things, like I didn't want to create any further diastasis recti, where your abdominal muscles separate even more than they already do during pregnancy. So there's a lot of things that you can kind of prevent or impact in a positive way during pregnancy. Um, but if you need more information, do your, dil dil do your due diligence, do your own research or find someone that will, because at the end of the day, unfortunately, OBGYNs are amazing surgeons. They're amazing to help you safely get through pregnancy with the baby. That's what they are there for. They are not diet and nutrition or diet and fitness experts around pregnancy. Yeah. I'm very thankful that my OBGYN is super supportive of lifting and lifestyle. Um, she was awesome throughout it. She's like, just do anything that you're Thank comfortable you. with. And um, obviously, don't be stupid, essentially. But I think years ago, they debunked the myth that your heart rate shouldn't get over like 120. And so she's like, yeah. just do do what you feel comfortable with, be smart about it. And then one of the books that I was going to recommend, if you are trying to get pregnant, or recently have found out that you are expecting first congratulations. Um, but outside of this podcast, Podcast. There's a great book that I read as we were getting ready to start trying um, for Marcus several years ago, and it's called Real Food for Pregnancy. I can link it out in the show notes. You guys can look it up on Amazon. Really great book. But we've talked a lot about fatty acids. We've talked a lot about you know the needs for protein and the importance of that um, for tissue, brain, um, and all of the organs. But let's cover a few other things here that are really impactful. So we mentioned leafy greens. What do we mean by that? Well, this is where we're looking at you know spin spinach, broccoli, dark green lettuces, let's think, you know, kale, collard greens, bok choy, green beans, asparagus, anything that you like that you could, I would say, microdose in during pregnancy. I know, as I mentioned before, I would do spinach in my smoothies. I would throw spinach finely chopped up uh, into eggs with some cheese at some points in time. Um, I would do a lot of, I love asparagus, like a little bit of Parmesan on top of it. So I would cook it in ways that I felt that I could stomach it and not just eat let's say like steamed broccoli, right? Like I remember doing um, a broccoli cheddar soup when I was pregnant, that was delicious. And so even if you can microdose these things in, you're still gonna be getting the benefits and the you know nutrients from the little bit that you can put in. When you are snacky and you want refined carbs, where I would say is this is what we, we tell our clients, let's think of what the better option is. Instead of going for a bag of chips that is fried in corn oil or vegetable oil, safflower oil, like inflammatory oils, could we aim for some cleaner versions like Siete Foods? I love their products. They're all made with coconut or olive oil, avocado oil, really great options for tortillas. They have hard shell tortillas. They have chips. They have um, all kinds of things. Rice cakes. I did a lot of rice cakes. You guys know I love my skinny, the mini rice cakes. Um, rice crackers too. Becca uses those, the three ingredients. And then just think too, in terms of cereals, like better quality cereals. Like we like Kashi and Becca has a couple that she uses, but ones that are not just filled with sugar and high fructose corn syrup. Yep. 
Mag- Magic Spoon's great. Catalina Crunch is great. Um, I would do sometimes like a little bit of Honey Nut Cheerios on top of my cereal or something like that, for, or on top of my yogurt or something like that for a crunch. Um, but yeah, cereal was definitely there on occasion. I just stuck to the serving size. That's the biggest thing. That I, like, try not to eat five bowls of cereal. Um, and then organic full fat dairy is actually really beneficial during pregnancy. It has a ton of calcium in it. It's very helpful for tolerance levels of baby too, potentially when they're born. Um, and so utilize grass fed whole milk, milk, eggs, yogurt, cheeses, hard cheeses. So I would utilize a lot of yogurt when I taught, cause I tolerated it during pregnancy. Um, and it was a great source of protein that I was able to get in. Um, so obviously the more whole fat you can find, the less processed it is, the less added sugars there usually are. So always try to pick a grass fed whole milk option. Um, and then iron is extremely important during pregnancy. So make sure that you are getting in things like red meat, if you can tolerate it fish, poultry, dried fruits are great. And then like we talked about folate coming from spinach, asparagus, greens, Brussels sprouts, root vegetables, whole grains, certain beans, kidney beans, white beans, salmon, even orange juice guys. Like it's not horrible to include these things if they are helping you get the nutrients in and it's what you can stomach. Um, Even avocado is great for folate. So a lot of information here. Hopefully you guys found some good nuggets in terms of how to help support a healthy pregnancy, how to help support you and baby, but try, try the best to get away from the concept of like pregnancy is just a time to eat all the things that you're too afraid to eat outside of pregnancy and just kind of like let loose to an extent. Yeah. Like give yourself some grace guys. Pregnancy can be hard, but at the end of the day, also remember you are growing a human life and you, we are respond like that is one of the greatest but also biggest responsibilities as a mother is you are responsible for this baby so try to look at it that way too. get your body what it can take in what you can tolerate in the form of good nourishing whole foods as much as possible so that that baby is set up as best as you can for life thank you for listening to the food code if this episode resonated with you please share rate and review as this helps us reach others around the world with that thank you for listening we'll be back soon Love you guys.